This is Inside Shale, a feature of the West Virginia Oil and Natural Gas Association. We cover the latest news and information from the industry that is shaping West Virginia. Natural gas is reducing emissions, lowering the cost of energy, and creating jobs. And with natural gas, America is on a path toward a better energy future. Think about it. This is Inside Shale Weekly. Welcome to Inside Shield Weekly. I'm your host, Hoppy Kirchival. Full show for you today. Coming up in just a moment, Corky DeMarco with the West Virginia Oil and Natural Gas Association. Then later this half hour, Lloyd Jackson, Vice President of the Oil and Gas Association, President of Jackson Gas. He'll talk about the state of the industry in his neck of the woods and also about the sometimes difficult job of finding workers qualified to participate in the industry. Coming up later, Bob Orndorff, Senior Policy Advisor for Dominion Resources, and also Bob Tippy. Bob Tippy is editor of the Oil and Gas Journal. Joining us first, though, on Inside Shale is Corky DeMarco. Corky, welcome. How are you? Good morning, Hoppy. How are you? I'm well, thank you, sir. Recently, there was a meeting of the Natural Gas Association, Interstate Natural Gas Association. Once again, the emphasis was on needed infrastructure. What came out of that meeting? Well, Hoppy, I think it, it drew everybody's attention to just how much uh, pipeline is going to be uh, required to get um, this glut of natural gas that we have, especially in the Appalachian Basin, uh, to underserved and unserved areas in the United States, as well as uh, getting it to ports of call, which then we can use to... Uh, ship overseas. But there are a number of pipelines that are under construction, several just in West Virginia or with parts of those pipelines in West Virginia. Is the estimate that what's under construction now or in the planning stages now will meet that demand? It probably will in the very short term, but long term, Hoppy, uh, we're going to need we're going to need more more pipeline and more infrastructure. I mean, if you think about the Northeast where they have traditionally used fuel oil in Vermont, New Hampshire, parts of Connecticut, and Maine, you know, that's a whole new market. Uh, and that's a, a market that we have uh, served a little bit through Canada. But most of the, most of the uh, heating and cooling in that part of the country has been done with electricity or fuel oil, which is, which is extremely expensive in comparison. Corky DeMarco is with us, West Virginia Oil and Natural Gas Association. Corky, we know that the production has been relatively flat in the region for some time now. Uh, we're told primarily because of price, but obviously there is an infrastructure aspect to this. So do industry leaders believe that if the infrastructure were in place, the pipelines were in place now, that even if the price was uh, depressed as it is now, there'd be more production? There, there certainly would be. I mean, if you've got, you know, if you've got a commodity that's in demand, it certainly, it certainly drives the, our ability to continue to produce. Maybe not with the veracity that we first did, or maybe, maybe with a, with a uh, more intense veracity. It's just going to depend on how much of this gas we can get to these unserved and underserved areas. Mm -hmm. Corky DeMarco is with us with the West Virginia Oil and Natural Gas Association. So the infrastructure, the need for infrastructure, the planned pipelines continue to dominate discussion. What else is on the agenda right now for the industry? Well, Hoppy, we're, we're, in, a wait, we're in a wait and see. Uh, you know, we've got some legislation that we will offer again this, uh, this session on uh, pooling. We will also be talking about uh, some ways to uh, uh, increase uh, or, or sh excuse me, shorten the time frame it takes to get permits. You know, we got permits jammed up in some cases for six to nine months, uh, which, is, which is unacceptable uh, when we need to uh, move this industry. I mean, we are the backbone of what's happening in this part of the country right now, and we need to do everything we can um, to help facilitate uh, this production and then transmission of gasoline. Well, let's gasoline go to uh, gas. uh, let's go to pooling first. And on the show a couple of weeks ago, I had Delegate Woody Ireland, who right. is the guy who's really been spearheading the attempt to get uh, lease integration, force pooling, get that legislation through. And right now, we don't have it for. 
uh, for horizontal uh, drilling in West Virginia. And, of course, it came very close last session. There's been a lot of discussion about that. It failed in the House on a tie vote. So what will change this time? And you're, you're at the Capitol almost every day on this. What do you think will change this time? Well, I think we've done a good job, Hoppy, of holding meetings around the state with key people and communities where uh, there was some hesitation on their legislators' part. Uh, the industry, although we have supported these discussions at the local level, it's been by the, it's, these discussions have been mainly held by uh, representatives from the Farm Bureau and the Mineral and, and Landowners Council and also the um, uh, uh, other groups, Soro that have... folks okay. and, and other interested parties. And so we've kind of stayed out of it uh, just because we wanted to make sure that the industry – uh, was not tainting the process, and it was open, and people could talk to other folks who felt strongly about uh, this piece of legislation in addition to the industry. We know, though, under the Capitol Dome, it's about counting heads, and you've been around a while. You've counted a lot of votes. Uh, have you counted votes yet? I have not, Hoppy, although I have had, during the interim process, several legislators uh, co come up to me and suggested uh, that we uh, have convinced them or other other groups have been out and talked to them and they feel uh, more comfortable with voting for uh, such a bill this time. Of course, uh, we know, again, how it works under the Capitol sometimes. If 10, if ten lawmakers say they're for you, maybe you can count five votes out of that or seven votes. Well, so that's, <laughs> that's gotta... absolutely right. And we certainly don't want to get, you know, our piece of legislation being held up by – legislators who want another piece of legislation. Well, then you have to get it early. You know that. I mean, will it run early? Because last uh, year, last last session, there was a lot of work during the session to create the pooling bill. Now a lot of that work has been done in interim, so will the bill be out early? We hope to have it out in the first week, Hoppy. Okay, that's significant. Now let's go to the permitting issue. What's the what's the issue on the permitting? Well, you, there's all there's all kinds of changes uh, and, and at the federal level, uh, you know, we're we're always we're always backed up with the Corps of Engineers. We're always backed up with Fish and Wildlife. Uh, I don't want to sound like it's a conspiracy, but certainly all these factors are being controlled by the U.S. EPA, which you know some some people think they're completely anti-fossil fuel. I'd like to think that that they may be a little wiser than than uh, than some of the critics seem seem to think. Uh, because people need um, need to be able to be cooled in the summertime and heat in the wintertime. So, you know, but but it, it's you know you can't cut trees during uh, periods from October through April because of nesting bats. Uh, you can't get permits on a timely basis to go under streams with a pipeline. I mean, we we have this technology. We've been using this technology. It all of a sudden appears to be inordinately uh, uh, length of time to get these permits. Mm -hmm. So, how do you resolve that? Well, we we are working. We are putting together. We've got a midstream committee. Uh, we we're working on issues uh, that we need to take to these various entities to try to get worked out. All right, Corky DeMarco, who's the Executive Director of the West Virginia Oil and Natural Gas Association. Corky, good to speak with you today and stay in touch. When we come back, Lloyd Jackson, Vice President of Wavanga. We'll talk with him. Also coming up, Bob Orndorff, Senior Policy Advisor for Dominion Resources, and Bob Tippy, Editor of Oil and Gas Journal. That and more when Inside Shale continues. Did you know that since 2001, MIT has run more than 75% of its operations with a natural gas cogeneration plant, producing both heat and power in the same process? As a result of this technology, MIT reports that their plant will reduce emissions by 45% when compared to their older technology. This is Inside Shale. Inside Shale continues. Welcome back. The Jackson family has been involved in the oil and gas industry for maybe maybe as many as four generations, either three or four generations. The latest incarnation is Lloyd Jackson, 
who uh, Lloyd Jackson second, who is uh, owner and operator of Jackson Gas in Southern West Virginia. Lloyd, good morning. Good to talk to you. How are you? Good morning, Hoppy. Is that right? The Doing second great. or the third? Lloyd the second or Lloyd the third? I'm the second, actually. Yeah. Was it your grandfather, or great grandfather, who was in the uh, oil and gas business out in the Midwest? Well, actually, my great grandfather was in, out in the Midwest. My grandfather was involved up in the Parkersburg area, uh, and actually was working for the old South Penn Oil Company when he was uh, transferred down to Yaki, which at one time was one of the largest oil fields in the, in the world uh, here in Lincoln County, and uh, home of the old Yaki Freeman Oil Company. You know the Yaki family; you've heard of mm-hmm. them in Boston. Right. And uh, and uh, my grandmother's from that Parkersburg area as well. They moved to Lincoln County, and we've been here ever since. So, uh, lifetime in the oil and gas business, going back several generations. What's the state of the industry right now? Well, you know, the industry's really changed, Hoppy, in the last uh, four or five years. This uh, the advent of horizontal drilling uh, has really made a difference in our industry, and uh, certainly we have a, an abundance of natural gas out here. But the industry itself, I would say still in the state of transition uh, into uh, a whole new world of that technology has caused, uh, not just in the natural gas industry, but across all of the uh, industry in the world. What are the biggest challenges facing the industry right now? Well, I mean, really the biggest challenge right now is oversupply. I mean, we've, uh, we know we routinely through the years, I've been in this business, my family's in this business a long time. We seems like about once every uh, decade, we drill ourselves into poverty at times, but <laughs> this one's a little bit different. Huh? Yeah, it is. It is. It, it, this one's really different. The, the, it, it, the change in technology is really, I mean, the, the word's overused, but it really has caused a paradigm shift in our industry. Uh, people like to blame it on hydraulic fracturing. That's really not what it's all about. It's really about horizontal drilling, uh, accompanied by hydraulic fracturing uh, that goes on within the horizontal drilling. It's just created a, an incredible amount of natural gas in this industry. Yeah, and you've got all this gas. I mean, the gas has always been there. It's just now, because of technology, there's access to it. And now, instead of drilling multiple wells, you can drill one well and access a lot more gas. So that, that obviously, again, you say it's overused, and it's true, but there has been a paradigm shift. So when does this thing level out, or, or which you need prices to be up some, at least, so there's more active drilling and, and aggression in the industry? Right now, it's kind of flat. Well, prices are flat, if not still kind of declining. You know, I was uh, there was an article in the Wall Street Journal last, I believe, it was Saturday. I don't know if you read it or not, about the well that EQT drilled up in Greene County, Pennsylvania, and uh, you know they drilled what some people say may be the largest natural gas well ever drilled, uh, and uh, uh, in terms of production, and their stock price went down, and the price and the price of natural gas went down. <laughs> Uh, because people see what's coming is, you know, the Utica has barely been tapped in this in this country, and now we're beginning to see the the Utica tapped. The Marcellus obviously has been very prolific. As you said, we knew those formations were there. We just didn't have the technology to access them in an economic way. Uh, and now that we can, uh, we have a lot of gas. So, so what's going to change things? I mean, clearly exports are one thing that may change. Uh, the facilities to export natural gas were just simply not available. Uh, when this boom started, and they're just now starting to to, to come online, uh, and of course, just to recover the whole worldwide economy right. and and a shift to natural gas, Hoppy. Uh, you know, it takes time to uh, to shift energy sources, whether it's in vehicles or in power plants, or whatever, to uh, a cleaner burning and and cheaper uh, source of fuel, but you just can't do that overnight. Well, Jackson's with his vice president of West Virginia Oil and Natural Gas Association, president of Jackson Gas, based in Lincoln County. He's been in the uh, gas business, his family, oil and gas business for several generations. Lloyd, let me switch gears because you're in a unique position. You operate a gas company. Uh, You've uh, been a businessman in West Virginia all your life. You're also a member of the State Board of Education, former member of the legislature, chair of the Senate Education Committee. Are, Are... are gas companies able to find and employ and retain skilled workers for the positions that are available? I know we're again we're kind of in a in a lull now in terms of hiring, but generally speaking, can they? Uh, Hoppy, I think generally speaking, it's it, 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 if if things ramp back up the way they were a couple of years ago, I think it will continue to be a challenge. Um, it, both in terms of just pure numbers, but in terms of skill sets. Uh, and that includes soft skills as well as you know the, the hard technical skills uh, and the educational backgrounds that people have to have. I think we can get there, Hoppy. 
but we're going to have to to work to do it. it it's just in this shifting economic climate, it's it's a difficult thing to calibrate, Hoppy, as mm-hmm. you can understand. So where are the where are the problems, uh, or where the, where were the problems when the boom took off, and where will the problems be? Is it as you said, is it in the physical labor, but also the more uh, the more skilled aspect, the engineers, et cetera? You know, Hoppy, it's it's no different. First of all, people need to understand it's no different here than any place else where you have uh, a demand for a workforce in a hurry. It takes a little bit of time to make that happen. Uh, I worry, I'll be honest with you, Hoppy, I worry a little bit about the drug issue in this state really? across okay. this country. Uh, you know, we, 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 we in our industry, uh, we have you know, comprehensive drug testing in, in every place that we work because of, uh, of the uh, Department of Transportation and other federal agencies and state agencies that require as well we should do that. Uh, and so that's a little bit of an issue in some places. Uh, I think uh, also... Uh, you know, just just the technical skills as we move on up the ladder, uh, just getting people trained for these jobs. It, it's not that we can't do it. It's just that it takes a little bit of time to make it happen. Are community colleges dialed in on this issue? They they have become increasingly and pretty rapidly dialed in. I know that both Fairmont and Northern have, have really stepped up to the plate. Again, it's a little bit hard when you start ramping up these programs and all of a sudden you hit a downturn like right. this. Uh, they get young men and women to enter those programs. But, you know, hopefully we can keep those programs online and we can start them up pretty quickly. Uh, Hobby, I think that the changes that we've made in the community college system in West Virginia over the past decade, and it's taken a decade to do it, have really, really first shown up in this natural gas boom because I really do think that, that a couple of the schools have really stepped up to the plate and they're willing to make this happen. We just need to get this economy straightened out. Lloyd Jackson's with us, vice president of the West Virginia Oil and Natural Gas Association, president of Jackson Gas, uh, based in Lincoln County's family and been in the gas and oil business for uh, a number of generations. Lloyd, everybody, when all the gas and oil people get together, they want to speculate as to when things will boom again or when there will be an increase in demand. Uh, we just had Corky DeMarco on. He, he believes it will come when uh, there's there's better infrastructure, and a lot of that's under construction being planned right now. What do you, What's your best guess as to when things will take off again, if they will take off again? Well, I think they will take off again, Hoppy. I mean, it's, you have this incredibly uh, abundant now cheap source of energy in the country and it's just a matter of being able to shift the economy to take advantage of it and as as Corky pointed out you have to you have to construct the infrastructure to make that happen uh, and so I you know we, we everybody keeps saying next year next year everything I read seems to say 2017 is when we ought to start seeing the turnaround both in terms of prices in terms of our ability to deliver the gas, that it's going to take another year to get the infrastructure in place to do that. So you got to get the infrastructure in place. And also with gluts, you get this cycle where when there's a glut, then the production tends to taper off and drillers say, we're not going to drill anymore right now. We're not going to produce anymore right now. So there has to be a time for that glut, to that kind of bubble to work its way through. Yeah, there's no question about that. But I tell you, Hoppy, it works its way through quicker than you think. Does it? Uh, when, when, when people aren't drilling... Uh, the, the you know these wells the, the production falls off on these new wells fairly quickly now this the well they drilled down in Green County seems to be holding up pretty well but you know the typical curve on a on a new well hop is pretty pretty steep in the first year so if, if people really lay off drilling for a year or so you, you'll see a fairly sharp decline just because those numbers drop pretty rapidly in that first year are so. you are you drilling right now. No, we we haven't drilled for several years now, Hoppy. These prices just don't just don't justify that. You know, we're we're not in the Marcellus area down right. here. Obviously, we do have the Marcellus Shell down here, but we're not in that robust area. Uh, as you probably have heard, there's a, a formation that's been tapped down here called the Rogersville. Right. There's been four or five wells drilled into it. Uh, they look to be very promising. Uh, you know, the companies that are doing those are keeping putting the cars pretty close to the vest yeah. right now, but. We really think it's going to make a change. Lloyd Jackson, who is vice president of the West Virginia Oil and Natural Gas Association, president of Jackson Gas, family's been in the gas and oil business for several generations. Lloyd, always good to speak with you. Thanks for coming on Inside Show. We appreciate it. Thanks for the call, Hoppy. All right, good to talk to you. We're going to take a break and come back. More to come, including Bob Orndorff with Dominion Resources and Bob Tippy, editor of Oil and Gas, the Oil and Gas Journal. This is Inside Shale. <laughs>
country's top mines are using natural gas to cut costs, improve their carbon footprint, as the best and brightest turn to natural gas. We should all think about using more natural gas to meet our power generation demands. According to Penn State, the switch to natural gas was a big step toward cleaner and more sustainable energy sources. This is Inside Shale. Inside Shale continues. I'm Hoppy Kirchable. Bob Tippy is editor, chief editor of the Oil and Gas Journal and has been since 1999. Before that, he was on the staff starting way back in 1977. So it's ha if it's happened in the oil and gas industry roughly the last four decades, Bob Tippy has written about it. He joins us on Inside Shale. Bob, good morning. Thanks for joining us. Good morning. Bob, first of all, what should the oil and gas industry be on the lookout for with what's happening over the next, will happen over the next couple of weeks in Paris with the climate talks, in your opinion? Uh, I think uh, it should look for a continuation of the politics that have already already uh, taken hold in the United States and elsewhere, which is which is really... Uh, kind of in general anti-fossil energy, uh, the activist groups that are motivating the uh, um, uh, the climate talks are very explicit about that. They, you know, the 350.org group uh, that successfully blocked uh, the Keystone XL pipeline says keep it in the ground. Um, so uh, uh, if there were to be a legally binding agreement out of Paris, uh, theoretically it should help natural gas because the, the solar and, and uh, wind power that would be promoted are intermittent and need natural gas to back up. But in fact, the politics is oriented against all fossil energy in general. How can, but, but if you have the leaders of the world there, I mean, surely they understand, even if, even if they are uh, uh, true believers in climate change and true believers in, in man's contribution to that and true believers in what they, what they think are the evils of carbon, they must understand that the world cannot exist without carbon-based fuels, at least n not, in the, not in the near to immediate long term. Well, some of them do. Some of them have, 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 have already uh, you know, charged down the road uh, toward, toward very aggressive subsidization of renewable fuels and are retreating from that because the costs have proven to be so high. Uh, it was real interesting, you know, just in the weeks before the Paris summit, uh, the United Kingdom uh, re you know, retreated from, uh, uh, from aggressive subsidization of wind. and It had already canceled subsidi or subsidies for solar power uh, because the electricity costs in, in in Great Britain had had reached such painful levels. So, uh, you know, in some countries, there, are, there already is kind of a, a, a backlash against uh, the, the, the costs of, of, of these very aggressive prescriptions. And isn't that, when, when the thing starts to get getting down to cost, it seems to me that's when people start paying attention, not just the policymakers, the environmental group. That's when people pay attention is when they see that there's a cost issue or a reliability issue. I think that's a very important observation, um, you know, in, in polls in the United States, when people are asked what are the what are the pressing issues, most people rank uh, climate change very low. But of course, this is this is a very high priority of the of the Obama administration. So, uh, so the politics is, be dri is being driven uh, by a relatively small uh, group of uh, you know very very aggressive, uh, politically oriented, well funded, well organized. Uh, people and their representatives in the in the government, while the while the people are, are really kind of oblivious to what's going on, I think probably paying more attention to to terrorism. But you're absolutely right. When the costs hit, uh, people will say, wait, "Wait, what happened here?" And that, that, that's what happened in in England and and uh, parts of Europe. Yeah, and I think too that it's uh, some of the polls. Like if you ask people, "Are you concerned about the planet?" Yes. Do you want to? Are you concerned about these things? You'll say yes, but then you say, "Well, will you, will you pay twice as much of energy?" You say, "Well, wait a minute. I want to. I want to know. I want to know more about what's going on here." Bob Tippy's with his editor of the Oil and Gas Journal has been chief editor since 1999. Before that, he was writing for him since 1977. Where we we talk a lot on this program, Bob. Let me switch gears a little bit about where the ga natural gas industry is headed. And of course, West Virginia sitting right on top of Marcellus and Utica. But things have been pretty depressed for the last uh, 18 months, maybe two years. What are industry folks saying about what's going to happen here? A, a, a growing concern. It's not, you know, it's not top of mind, but it's a growing concern. Is that the type of, of obstructionist uh, anti-fossil energy politics that, that that stymied Keystone XL is also at work in some of the pipelines necessary to uh, to, to move natural gas out of the Marcellus into markets. Uh, you're seeing that happen happen in Massachusetts right now, where uh, where there's opposition to to pipelines um, 
and, and, and the Massachusetts uh, electricity is, is, is very costly. Mm-hmm. Um, but I think it was the attorney general there uh, uh, produced a study that said, oh, you know, the, these pipelines wouldn't help um, lower electricity prices, which I think is, is, is an unreasonable uh, conclusion. But um, the, the groups that are, you know, the, the, the extremist groups uh, that are against fossil energy have learned that you can lower uh, the value of hydrocarbons in the ground by by stymieing the outlets, right? And uh, uh, and and that's that's happening right now. That's that's why I say much of the politics uh, uh, stimulated by by Paris is, is already having an effect. Yeah, I mean, when when Yoko Ono can take out a full page ad in the New York Times against a pipeline in New York, or uh, when you know groups can stand up against uh, exporting natural gas, I mean, it has an impact. Yes, and. Uh, Bob Tippy is with us. He's chief editor of the Oil and Gas uh, Journal, has been since 1999. Before that, he was a writer for them for, since 1977. So, so given that, though, is, is the because the oil and gas folks in West Virginia think that it's going to come back or there'll be another surge maybe in 2017. That seems to be the numbers everybody's tossing around. I'm not sure exactly why, because they think that the gut will have passed, uh, demand will have increased, maybe the infrastructure will be, some of the infrastructure will be in place by then. What do you think? Uh, yeah, I, I think that's possible. I mean, the Marcellus is a world-class gas resource, um, and and the idea that you can leave it all on the ground is is pretty absurd. The the economic, uh, the potential economic value is is, is so great, um, uh, and and then you have the potential economic value of of lowered electricity costs at the other end of the pipeline. That that I I'm confident that that economics will will prevail uh, in the end. And I'm not saying we shouldn't be concerned about climate change. You right. Know, r- right now, it's either or, it's black or white. You're, you know, you're either a, a believer or a denier, and that's, and that's all absurd. We've got to learn to have a reasonable conversation about things. And with, within that reasonable conversation, there has to be a place for these, these economic uh, uh, projects to move forward for the benefit of people. Yeah. Bob Tippy, editor of the Oil and Gas Journal. Are we losing companies now? Are companies just not able to make it because of the uh, slowdown? Absolutely, there, uh, there, there, there have been a number of bankruptcies. Um, uh, there, there will be more. Uh, a lot of companies are under under, dis, uh, under stress. stress right now. Um, uh, you know, industry wide, because of the the oil price collapse and gas by by association, uh, we've had the largest uh, contraction in in exploration production spending ever. Um, it, it really is a dramatic. Uh, a contraction. The industry will emerge from this uh, smaller uh, than before in terms of numbers of companies, um, and, in ter- and in terms of of uh, physical capacity, because mm-hmm. a lot of rigs are are getting scrapped and, uh, and things. So it's a it's, it's a it's a tough. A very tough slog. Bob, finally, we wondered, too, in West Virginia, there was an announcement a couple of years ago about a planned uh, ethane cracker in Wood County on the Ohio River. That hasn't happened yet. It's still on the drawing board. Uh, the proposed crackers in the region, but it really hasn't happened. And you get these general explanations like, well, we're going to see these are big projects. The price is depressed now, but I think they'll actually help. But so what for this, if you're I know you're a Midwestern guy, I believe, but aren't you? Aren't you in the Midwest? I'm in Houston. So, so but in sitting on top of Marcellus and Utica and all these gas reserves, isn't it logical that at some point uh, there would be the secondary and tertiary industries that would develop associated with those with that those gas supplies? Uh, absolutely. There, there's a lot of ethane in that gas, and that ethane can be uh, can be cracked and turned into ethylene. Uh, the problem with that is, uh, what do you do with the ethylene once you have it? You've got to, you know, you have to have other capacity to polymerize it and turn it into. You know, turning it turning into polyethylene, other uh, other 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 um, uh, chemicals. So it's kind of you know getting the first olive out of the bottle. Mm-hmm. Um, mm-hmm. Uh, an ethane cracker by itself um, uh, needs needs some other infrastructure and and uh, you know in general across the industry across the world, companies are retreating from big projects. Oh, um, uh, that's I mean that's just another. Uh, that, that's just another thing that's going on in the, in the oil and gas business. Um, uh, there have just been a lot of projects that have been uh, come in way over way over budget, very expensive. Uh, the, the economics haven't haven't turned out well. Um, that's that that's just kind of an undercurrent. So there's a there's a bit of a, a bit of a reluctance to to invest uh, uh, in major projects now. And now a single uh, uh, ethane cracker isn't what you call a mega project, but 
uh, an ethane uh, cracker in West Virginia, you know, a new area, um, that, that, that begins to get a little, little more risky. And, mm. and, and there's competition for the ethane. You know, there's a, you, know, there's a, you can lay a pipeline to, to the ethane crackers on the Gulf Coast, and that's a, you know, there, there, there's an active project there right. up in the Marcella. So, um, you know, I, I, I'm not saying it's not going to happen. I'm just saying there's just a lot, of, a lot of business competition and a lot of uh, underlying trends that have to sort themselves out. Uh, and that all has to happen in a period of uncertainty created by the by the Paris talks. Bob Tippy, chief editor of the Oil and Gas Journal. Bob, great insights. I really appreciate your time. Thanks for coming on Inside Shale. Nice to be here. Thank you. Thank you very much. We'll take a break and come back. When we come back, Bob Orndorff, senior policy advisor for Dominion Resources. We'll get his take on all this when we return. Stay with us. Schools in the Marcellus Shale region, such as Westmoreland County Community College, Pennsylvania College of Technology, West Virginia Northern Community College, Eastern Gateway Community College in Ohio, and Broome Community College in New York came together and formed Marcellus Shale Net, a recruitment, training, placement, and retention program for high priority occupations in the natural gas industry. You're listening to Inside Shale. Inside Shield continues with Bob Orndorff, Senior Policy Advisor for Dominion Resources. Bob, good morning. Thanks for joining us on Inside Shale. Good morning, Hoppy. How are you doing I'm well. Today? You know, Bob, I'm just, I was thinking here with the previous three guests, and uh, price continues to be fairly depressed. Not sure when that's going to come back. Uh, the climate talks underway in Paris. Uh, the uh, this the general uh, the uncertainty about the the pipeline construction. I mean, they're being constructed, but there are environmental issues you have to overcome. There's public objections. There's a tremendous amount of uncertainty right now. And if there's one thing business hates, it's uncertainty. How do you guys cope with all the uncertainty right now? Well, just, despite what seemingly is a great deal of the, the discrepancy and, and uncertainty, I, you know, this morning I was coming to work and traffic was backed up about a mile uh, off of the interstate, um, primarily due to uh, construction workers associated with the industry. So even though it may seem like it's slowing down to the average Joe coming to work or commuting to work, uh, still a lot of traffic on the road, still a lot of people going to work in the industry. So uh, I think that's a positive thing. I think what we're seeing is the slowdown may be a good thing, but it's a, about ready to get busy again with a lot of the projects that are out there on the market. There's a, there's and, a glass there's a glass half full. We needed that. We needed that today. <laughs> so so in terms of say it's about to get busy again. Now, Corky was saying, well, people think 2017. What do you think? Well, you know, I'm not, I'm going to be quoting from a uh, PowerPoint that I received the other day from an INGA uh, foundation meeting uh, on all the projects that are out there. And if everything comes to fruition, um, probably 2016, 2017 will get extremely busy for the industry, not just here in, in north central West Virginia, but throughout the country as well. Why? What made you what, – what, what, how did they arrive at those conclusions? Well, if you if you look at what was predicted at uh, on the PowerPoint, um, by who, and who was that again? Who made the PowerPoint? Uh, the PowerPoint was done by uh, R- Robert Reese from Sheehan Pipeline. Sheehan okay. is one of the major pipeline uh, uh, con- con- contractors in the country and builds a lot of the major projects. Okay. And we, as w- in the industry, we look at spreads as an indicator um, of. Of a, of a project. So, for example, a spread may be anywhere between 30 to 50 miles, depending on the terrain, uh, depending on the difficulty of the build, depending on what you're crossing. So a spread, it's not necessarily clearly defined, but they try to equalize the project based on the amount of work that it'll take to build within a certain corridor. Mm-hmm. So in 2016, uh, we're predicting that there'll be 119 spreads. So a spread Across the country, by, across the country. Cross country by okay. one one company. So there's, and, and a company may have multiple spreads. Uh, so it, it's very difficult to clearly to define that. But the amount of projects, 2017, 100 spreads, 2018, 85 spreads, uh, the sheer numbers that it's going to take to 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 develop these and build these projects is just almost overwhelming. Mm-hmm. So what that will do also will it'll create an outlet for the gas. Hopefully, we'll create a, 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 a bigger need and supply and demand. Hopefully, we'll drive prices, and hopefully, this all will 
help us w- overcome some of the challenges we have today uh, by, inc- you know, we don't want the we don't want the price to go up too high for, from a consumer perspective, but from a uh, from a driller perspective, it does it needs to come up so it, it equalizes their investment that they're making um, in, on the drilling end. Well, there's always a sweet spot on price. What's the price where people are still going to utilize gas at the same or whatever that is, but still that it's profitable for the producers? So whatever the product is, whatever the commodity is, there's always a sweet spot. So. Well, I think we look at the sweet spot of being around four dollars an MMBTU, mm-hmm. and um, most most producers say they're comfortable with that. Uh, most uh, industry folks, you know, generating electricity, they're comfortable with that. So, you know, it's artificially depressed right now, and you know, we all enjoy it. We enjoy the, the price of gasoline at the pump. I saw dollar eighty nine yeah. uh, coming back from Charleston yesterday. So. Uh, that that's exciting. I mean, we all want to drive more un- under those circumstances. Got you. Got to you late, short time with you, but we'll have you back. Bob Orndorff, Senior Policy Advisor for Dominion Resources, capping off the show with some optimism today. Bob, great to talk to you. Thanks for coming on Inside Shale. Uh, thank you for having me on the show, Hoppy. All right, we appreciate it. Inside Shale continues right after this. And finally, the U.S. Energy Department's weekly inventory release showed a larger-than-expected increase in natural gas supplies, following which prices slid. Gas prices slid almost 8% to end the week at 221 per MMBTU Friday in a sell-off spurred by the greater-than-expected inventories of natural gas. So it continues to be a struggle out there. The question is, when will the prices come back? A lot of optimism if industry folks can hang in there a little bit longer. Thanks for joining us on this edition of the Inside Shale Weekly, a presentation of the West Virginia Oil and Natural Gas Association and the West Virginia Radio Corporation. Have a great day, everybody.